Hello and welcome back to the Sports Geek. I'm Jake Higgins with Mike Pruitt and Antonio Williams. As always, we're talking about the upcoming weekend's fights. Now, we have a packed card of the UFC fight night. And let's jump into the main card, though, because there is a fight that I want to talk about. Mike, you and I are actually on opposite sides of this fight. And I think it has the potential to be the fight of the night, personally. Miranda Maverick versus Macy Barber. And for anyone that's been paying attention to the UFC since the start of the pandemic, really, these women have dominated these fight nights, really. They, they have taken over these cards, and I wouldn't be surprised if Saturday is another example of this. Macy Barber, a well-known name in the UFC. Miranda Maverick, a woman with only two fights in the UFC, still looking to cement that name and make it a little bit bigger at the uh, women's flyweight weight class. And I'll just give out my pick already. I'm going with the underdog Macy Barber, partly because I found some spectacular value. Um, I think I found her on Wednesday night around one plus 150, something like that. She's that's down great. near like plus 130 at a lot of the sports books. So that's some great value. And I'm taking this in the sense of Barber, who has been tried and challenged multiple times by the UFC. She's taken a couple losses, recent losses, her most recent fights of these losses, actually. I think she's going to refocus, bounce back from those losses and get back to her winning ways. And she's had these trials and tribulations in the UFC, whereas Miranda Maverick, she also has two losses, but neither of those were in the UFC. They were rather earlier in her career. So I think Maverick's going to come in and she might be a little surprised with what she meets on the other end from Barber. I, I think you're right. Barber can really crack and she has... She has turned, uh, I mean, women are, women are very, very, very tough. They're, in my opinion, they're more mentally strong than men and they, they fight harder. They fight longer. I mean, this is true in, in long runs, 50, 150 miles. Sometimes women beat the best men by eight, 10 hours or something like that. But uh, I've seen Barber with, against JJ Aldrix, who's a very good boxer and she's game. And Jillian Robertson, I mean, they had never really shown signs of, of being a quitter and they, they both quit. I mean, a standing, she got two standing KO, TKOs against the cage. I mean, the, the girls just turned away. I mean, you don't see that very often at all. No, in the USC. And, uh, so that these girls aren't used to getting hit like uh, Barbara can hit. She can really crack. Um, and yeah, she's been, she's been tested at a higher level. She fought Roxanne Modafferi. Um, you know, she's uh, Alexa Grasso in her last fight. Alexa Grasso is really surging right now. She really uh, I actually picked Barbara in that fight and lost. But, uh, you know, I, I love Maverick. I think she's better overall. I think she's the she's the rightful favorite. But, you know, the line at, at uh, minus 140, minus 150, where it is right now, I think it's pretty solid. It's just, uh, you know, I'm a little biased, though. I, I will admit one of my former students ended up teaching her in, in Norfolk. She's a very smart girl, though, and – She's getting her master's in psychology and I like her fight IQ a little more than Macy's, but all Macy has to do is make this a dog fight. And I think it's 60, 40 on her end. So she is certainly a live dog. And if I could have found plus 150 plus 160, I would probably jump on her and that, and that, and we, it's a good reminder. We need to be fluid with our bets. If the line moves enough, we can, Go to the. We can just say, okay, now the value is on this fighter. We, we have to be where the like value that. is, um, and we can't look at it. that's a great point. Yeah, understanding yeah, where the value is is a skill set. Honestly, in this industry, it really is. We can't look at things like, uh, say, I pick fighter A, fighter A loses. I was wrong. Uh, not necessarily, because all I'm saying is, I I thought fighter A was say the odds were even and I thought fighter a was going to win six out of 10 times. Okay. The book said five out of 10 times. I said six and fighter a lost. That doesn't mean that I was dead wrong or I suck at this job or whatever. Um, I mean, the numbers at the end will show that or not, but it just, and, and it's also, it's, it's comforting. It, it keeps you from getting depressed. It keeps you from losing your confidence because you just say, I mean, obviously sometimes you just get waxed. You know, I had Gabriel Benitez over Billy Quarantillo last week as the favorite, and he got waxed three rounds. I mean, it doesn't happen often. I mean, those hurt, but uh, yeah, you, you can't look at it like that. You got to look, you got to be fluid with the value and, you know, just go bet the number more than you, you do the fighter, I think. 
No, yeah. you you say something that's really interesting, Mike, and and I think that's one of the things that that we should point out with this. Um, this is this sport, which what makes this sport so great is this is different than say boxing. This is different than say track, where it's like you you run track and field. I'm faster than you. I'm going to beat you. Right? Uh, boxing. Yeah. I'm better than you. Nine times out of 10, I'm going to beat you. Four ounce gloves make such a difference because in essence, it makes it as such that everybody has power. So yeah. we, we, and sure, some people, their power is greater than others. But generally speaking, with four ounce gloves, anybody can get knocked out or anybody can get finished. Anybody can get rocked. So with that being said, it is it is like you said, you don't take this personally in this sport in particular because Someone could be better than someone else. But again, when you start taking those four ounce gloves and it, it just, you know, it changes the dynamic. Let me just say it that way. It can, all, sometimes all it takes is that one punch. You could, you could be <laughs> winning the fight all three rounds. And in the final minute of that third round, the person that's down back against the wall just puts everything behind that right hook and they connect right and they win. It you happens in the sport. You're spot on. I mean, I think one of the famous ones that people put on Instagram and they make it a life story is Czech Congo, when basically you can make a case that that fight should have been stopped, right? When he was, uh, Barry. Yeah. right? He was getting pummeled. You can make a case that it should have been stopped, but they didn't stop it. He persevered. And, and, you know, now it's, again, it's, we, we now use that as a life lesson when people want to use it from a motivational standpoint. So, you know, I just say that to you, Mike, man, you, you're giving people great information, but this, you no, know, as we talk about this and we're giving you odds on this particular sport, this is different than almost any other sport on the face of the earth. All right, guys, we have three more fights to quickly get through here. So let's jump into the Darren Elkins and Derek minor fight. And, this is going to be quite the battle. I mean, these guys love to finish a fight. They don't like to leave it to the judges. So I don't know what side of this fight that I'm going to be on, but I may be looking at the uh, odds on whether or not this fight goes the distance. I haven't placed anything yet, but that's definitely where I'm looking at this next fight. Yeah, you know, I think you're right. Derek Minner is a first round or bust type of guy. And Darren Elkins has been taking advantage of fighters like that his whole career. He is a, he's a, he, you hit him 150 times. Guess what? Like hit, Offense is more tiring than defense. And, and you see it a lot. So yes. you hit somebody 150 times, they don't fall. Well, you're, you're tired and you're also a little mentally tired too. Cause right. well, everybody else fell. Why isn't this guy falling? And that's when Darren Elkins just keeps on coming. His nickname, the da nickname is the damage. And it, but it's not for the damage he's putting on people, you know. It's it's more like uh, they they damage him quite a bit, and then he comes in at the end and uh, saves the day for himself. But I just at this point in his career, I think he has taken far too much damage, uh, and everybody just it happens to us all. Uh, uh, you, you just once your chin gets checked enough, it's 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 a little weak and. Minner is a he, – he can crack on the ground. He's got good submissions. He's younger. I love that he's working with James Krause. Uh, James seems to be able to rein in these fighters who have bad habits and bad fight IQs, and they just seem to fight smarter under him. And he, he's very good in the corner. I know he's had some times where maybe he gives a little too much advice and it kind of tires somebody out, and, you know, because he's telling them every single thing to do every second. That could be too much. But, yeah. You know, I like the price on Minner here. If he was minus 200, I would say no way. But I believe he's a minus 150 or so. And that should be enough to take out a guy who essentially has lost his last five fights. He won his last fight, but the four previous no. And he was losing that last fight until his opponent gassed. If his opponents kept the gas, then we're talking about a guy who's lost five in a row. And he may not even be fighting still. So for that Minner. price, I'm, I'm going to take a chance on Minner. A method of victory to look at for that fight as well would potentially be just a submission, not by necessarily any specific fighter, just a submission in general. I mean, Derek Minner, 30 of his 37 fights have been finished by submission. 22 yeah. of those he won, but he has lost plenty on the floor as well. Uh, yeah. Darren Elkins, he won his most recent fight by a submission, so that's another spot to maybe look for some value. 
let's jump into this other women's fight on the main card, Aspen Ladd versus Macy Chazon. And this is going to be a fantastic fight between two women that each only have one loss to their name. And frankly, I'm backing Chazon. I'm backing the underdog woman again. She's at about a plus 180 odds is what I found her at. And she really, she's taller. She's got a longer reach than Aspen Lad, And she's just really a different beast. She's also fought more recently. She beat Renault back in March. She's fought in 2021. Whereas Aspen Lad, she is coming back into the ring. And I'm not, I'm not too big on the whole ring rust concept. I mean, we just saw Misha Tate last week after five years come back in and basically show no ring rust at all. But you still have two years outside of the octagon aspen lad may have at least a little bit of a transition time in that first round and there's only three rounds in this fight so if that one goes to chase on and this one goes to the judges table because aspen lad hasn't been in an octagon in two years it's going to be hard for her to come back and win this fight by a decision so give me chase on on the money line at plus 180 i believe is what i got it at yeah man i, I absolutely see where you're coming from and piggybacking on your point aspen you know, she's not very fast. Um, her striking isn't super technical. Her wrestling isn't super technical. She she bullies these girls. And uh, I don't think she's going to be able to bully Macy, you know, someone who's a, a bigger bully, essentially. You know, um, if, if she puts Macy on her back, uh, Chase Young's going to have some problems, I think. But, you know, trying to back Aspen at minus 200, that's, that's too much of a stretch for me. And like you said, both girls only have one loss. So they're fairly evenly matched. Yeah, I think Aspen Ladd's a better fighter, but not at minus 200, no way. So if you've got plus 170, plus 180 on Macy Chason, she's a bigger bully. You know, I, I, if, uh, and the other girl's not that technical worth of wrestling. So if they can keep it standing, she's got the reach. You know, I think she'll touch her up. Absolutely. And so this is a fantastic main card we've already talked to you about. So let's f- talk about the main card fight, though. TJ Dillashaw making his return to the UFC, fighting against Corey Sandhagen. And Dillashaw, he has been out for the past two years. He got caught with a banned substance, had to serve a two-year suspension. He's back now. He's apparently clean, at least hasn't been flagged for anything that we have seen so far in leading up to the fight. And personally, I think there is a lot of hate going against Dillashaw right now. So I Mm -hmm. think that TJ has a lot of value actually to his name. He's at about plus 160 right now on the books. And I think that's mainly because a lot of people are backing Sandhagen for the fact that TJ Dillashaw got labeled a cheater. So people are really unsure of Mm -hmm. the quality that they're going to see from this fighter coming back in. I'm not too worried, though. I mean, he came off a two, two years Like I said, with the Aspen Lad Chiazon fight, I'm not too worried about ring rust, but I don't think it's going to work in Aspen Lad's favor. I do think TJ Dillashaw will be able to get past that ring rust. It's going to be a five-round fight, though. It'll be interesting to see if this goes to those later rounds, how he deals with that. Yeah, it it really is. I mean, I'm I'm super excited to see TJ coming back. You know, he's obviously a former champ, you know, arguably one of the best 135 fighters of all time. I love that weight class. I think it's the... Yeah. the deepest weight class there's a million just excellent matchups that are just just going off in my head right now but you know it reminds me of when alistair overeem fought um the uh the russian uh, drago volkov 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 yeah sorry yeah. when he fought volkov yeah um you know they on on the promos they kept pushing alistair and say oh it's his uh you know he's so old and he's done all this and done all that and it was he was all of a sudden he was this darling Mm-hmm. And I, I saw that and reflect the betting line and the line movement. I said, wow, all this money's coming in on Alistair. And people are just forgetting the fact that stylistically, it's just, uh, Volkov matched up very well against him. I, I, right. I didn't like that at all. Um, and I jumped all over it. And I thought it, was, uh, it wasn't hate towards Volkov, but it was a love bias, like you said. And in this fight, you've got a love bias and a recency bias with Sanhagen, who's looked good recently had a flying knee knockout and things like that against Frankie Edgar. That's just, that's big, high profile highlight, but, but more so you have a hate bias with Dillashaw. Cause people didn't like him. They took Faber and Garbrandt's, you know, side when he left team alpha male. And then obviously the drugs, the, the EPO. So people feel like, Oh, he cheated us. 
you know, by, by cheating in the sport. I understand, I understand 100 percent why people are mad about that. But, you know, as uh, as handicappers, we we have to just call it like it is. And I don't think he's a plus 160, plus 170 underdog. I, I just don't. I mean, Sanhagen has a 30 percent takedown defense. That's mm-hmm. a fact. I mean, and he hasn't fought. These aren't great wrestlers taking him down. Rafael Asuncao, I mean, he's a Brazilian guy. He's not a great wrestler. He took him down four times. And, uh, yeah, I, just, I think that's a part of the game where TJ can take him down. I don't think Corey's going to get the takedown. And we're also in the smaller octagon, you know, coming back to your point. And uh, Corey Sanhagen, he kind of took Frankie Edgar, TJ, and Dominic Cruz's style and morphed it into his own. He's got this crazy footwork, and he's a taller guy, and he's moving around. And, you know, I, I, this one might come down to the front foot because people think those small octagon fights, the person who has the better wrestling is all – is definitely the uh, – that definitely favors them, the small octagon, but it's more so who who is the front foot fighter? Who wins that who battle? Yeah. Pushing forward, and yeah. because there's there's less room. I mean, you get to that black line so quickly, and then one more step, and you're on the cage. Yeah. And from there, it's yeah that you're really making life harder on yourself. So, Mike, as as we're seeing this, we've seen the UFC do this a lot, and I really wanted to get your perspective on this. And the UFC does this a lot. And sometimes we see this sort of blow up in their face, but they will take a high profile fighter who's a former champion, maybe coming back from an injury, maybe coming back from a loss or both. And they will take them and immediately put them at the top of the line. In this case, uh, TJ Dillashaw. And of course, San Hagen has a very low number next to his name, meaning has a high ranking in the division. We saw this, of course, with Conor McGregor as well, with fighting Dustin Poirier. And we saw that as well when he fought Khabib also. And we've also seen this with Ronda Rousey coming off a loss as well. So with that being said, how do you feel about the UFC doing this? And again, I know they have to uh, protect credibility. So you can't, and I mean this with all due respect, because everybody that competes in the UFC is a beast. But you can't give a person coming off of maybe a title run, someone that we know they're going to run over. But at the same time, what do you think about them immediately sort of going to the front of the line and going right into the deep end in their first fight back if they've been off for an extended amount of time? Uh, Purely from a fan standpoint, I love it. I mean, I I can't wait for TJ Dillashaw and and Corey Sanhagen. But if if I'm TJ or if I'm his manager or his uh, handlers, his coaches, no, I I don't want that. (laughs) No way. Not against a younger fighter. I mean, Misha did it, but she fought a girl 10 years older than her. She came back at 34. She fought a 44 or 43-year-old, so – Right. In that case, I like it. But, you know, these guys, these guys and girls, they're so confident. I mean, you, you of course, have to have a ridiculous, um, ludicrous amount of confidence to compete in this sport at no all. No and not even at the highest level. So, yeah, they're crazy. They think they can beat anybody on the planet. Uh, <laughs> that's just who they are. So, I mean, when they sit down at the table, um, it's just not in them to say, well, I don't think I don't think I could beat that person. Right? No, I can win. I mean, if they don't have 110% confidence before the octagon, things go bad. They sure as heck aren't going to have 110% at that time. So, That's right. you know, I, I don't like it. Um, yeah. They, I mean, from a fan standpoint, yes. But like from a betting standpoint, it, may, it, may, it makes things very difficult for us. And, right. But in this case, uh, you know, a lot of love has been given to Corey and, you know, about the, the love bias for him, the hate bias for TJ. So, it's kind of created a nice little niche for us dog chasers. I mean, a former world champion who has been keeping up his training has always been in tip top condition. I think it's a solid play. Guys, I think we have covered this uh, UFC fight night from top to bottom. Well, it's going to be quite the fight weekend that we have going on. So I think it's time that we just sign off. You have been watching the Sports Geek. I'm Jake Higgins with Mike Pruitt and Antonio Williams. As always, it's been fun. Let us know in the comments what bets you like. I mean, Mike and I, we're on opposite sides of that Maverick vs. Barber fight. Let us know what side you're going to be on for that. And we'll make sure to see you next time. We'll be back with some more UFC picks. Don't worry.